uh, we have four very, very, we have four very, very uh, distinguished uh, speakers coming in. Serge Eroche, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, Moti Segev, uh, who does uh, everything, nonlinear optics. Uh, Nadir, 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 how do you say, Nadir? Nadir. Nadir. Yeah. Uh, and Geta uh, from the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And he works on plasmonic metamaterials. And Ferenc Krauss, who was the uh, co inventor of attosecond science. So, so uh, just uh, an incredible group of, of four people. Uh, and you can sign up on the website, but you have to get yourself there. And, uh, uh, maybe you have other priorities in life. Okay, so uh, we are at, oh, so, so there's no class next week, uh, but I was checking my notes last night, and I found out that the lecture I should give next week I have a perfect recording of it from last year. <laughs> so I'm just going to simply uh, distribute the lecture from last year uh, for you so that you can do, uh, you, you can participate that way. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, so the topic of today's lecture, and next week's for that matter, is the uh, quantum mechanical theory <clears throat> just to say writing. Of course, I mean of the nonlinear susceptibility. I'll abbreviate nonlinear susceptibility this way. So even in your first homework, you developed a very classical model for predicting the size of the uh, uh, nonlinear response uh, based on the uh, an harmonic oscillator, uh, Hooke's law, uh, or a generalization of Hooke's law, uh, where you added nonlinear terms to the response. And we all love harmonic oscillators. Uh, we learned how to deal with it uh, in our very first physics courses. But we know that classical physics does not always give us the right answer. So, uh, so you really want to do these calculations quantum mechanically if, if you want to get uh, more accurate predictions. In the broadest sense, I think there are two reasons why we might be interested in, in doing uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, One is accurate numerical predictions. In your first homework set, you developed this uh, classical model for nonlinearities, but there were coefficients that we called little a and little b, and we just grabbed them out of the air. Uh, so, so the model that you used for your homework perhaps gives you the right functional dependence but it really couldn't tell you the size of these nonlinear effects. But we think that if we do the calculation using quantum mechanics, at least in concept, we can make quantitative predictions for how big optical nonlinearities are going to be. Uh, second one, uh, how even to say it? Uh, The nature of the nonlinear susceptibility, and what do I mean by this? Uh, full permutation symmetry. I, I've mentioned a couple times in class that why do we think that for a lossless material, the susceptibility will obey full permutation symmetry. And I told you that, well, one way of seeing this is you calculate the nonlinear susceptibility using quantum mechanics, and you look at the expression, and you find that that's true. So some of these uh, general principles uh, of how nonlinear interactions work come out of, the, uh, non out of this calculation. 
I think these are somewhat independent reasons why we uh, are interested. Next question then is how do we do the calculation? And as you may know, or maybe don't know, uh, there are two conceptually different ways of doing a uh, uh, quantum mechanical calculation. The first one is we can calculate the time evolution of the wave function. So we're told that if you know the wave function, you know everything there is to know about a uh, material system. Uh, so if so, I can say I'm thinking of an atom, and I'm going to apply an intense laser field to that atom. And I'm going to see how the wave function becomes modified because I applied an intense laser field to the atom, and from that, using procedures that we'll develop over the next two lectures, you can predict the size of the linear and nonlinear susceptibilities. But there's another way of doing it. Uh, and that is to study the time evolution of the density matrix. Now, just a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of the density matrix? Good. Uh, and the rest of you, don't worry, within a week you will have heard of the density matrix because that's what we're going to do. The, uh, a real quick introduction. The, uh, you can write down a wave function only for what is known as a pure state, whereas you can write down the density matrix for a mixed state. So uh, in there are legitimate quantum mechanical systems that are not pure states. They cannot be described by a wave function. Let me try to draw the distinction. In a pure state, you could have a concept in which, in which the state vector is in a linear superposition. I'm using symbolic language now. And if you don't know the language, you will by the end of the lecture, so don't worry. So, you can think of a system in which the wave function is a linear superposition of the ground state and the excited state. But for a mixed state, I'm thinking of something like this. Maybe some of the atoms are in the ground state and some of the atoms are in the excited state, but you don't know which ones. You, you, you know that uh, you have a big vapor cell or you have a street lamp, one of these sodium lamps that grows, that glows orange. And in a sodium lamp, some of the atoms are in the upper level, because why would you get light out otherwise? Uh, but many of the atoms are in the ground state. It is a quantum mechanical system, but you don't know which atom is in the upper level and which is in the lower level. So that's what we call a, a mixed state. Uh, I guess there is a view that says that nothing in quantum mechanics is easy. But uh, to uh, uh, express this thought, working with the density matrix is much more difficult than working with the wave function. So uh, our understanding of quantum mechanics is perhaps comes better 
by thinking of the time evolution of the wave function. But some of the problems, but if you want to do nonlinear optics, sometimes you find yourself in the position where you do not know the state of every atom in the system. So we're going to do both. We're going to first do uh, the wave function treatment of quantum mechanics, and we're going to do that today. And then next week, we're going to see how to do the density matrix uh, formalism. Uh, chapter three is long. Uh, do I owe you new homework, by the way? I think I do, don't I? Yeah. Okay, so uh, make myself a mental note that, uh, that you need a new homework assignment to keep you busy over the weekend. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, chapter three is very long and very difficult. Uh, I think it would not be realistic for me to tell you that you have to read and understand everything that's in chapter three. Uh, probably a better trade-off would be to say that those parts of chapter three that I cover in lecture, certainly you need to, uh, to, to be responsible for that. You'll also see that some of these equations would not fit on the blackboard. <laughs> so, so, uh, so there are parts of the development where I will indicate how it works, and then you just have to go home and, uh, and go through it on your own. But let's say we will restrict this to the topics that, uh, that, that are most important. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me give you a really quick motivation to uh, what we'll be thinking about here. Uh, well, we've been talking about third harmonic generation, and I've tended to draw pictures like this. But uh, let's say that this is the ground state that I've called A, but what if we were so lucky that there was an excited state of the atom almost at this energy here, and another one almost at this energy here, and another one almost at this energy here? Well, common sense common sense after you've been working on this for 25 years, common sense might tell you that uh, you get a much larger nonlinear response if this optical field at frequency omega nearly resonantly excites this level. And you also get a bigger response if the two photon contribution can resonantly excite this level. So. That is the basic idea that we will be pursuing, that you get a large enhancement when you have a true energy eigenvalue, uh, a true energy eigenstate, eigenstate that is nearly in resonance with the applied field. Now, what I drew here is highly unrealistic because how likely is it that you're going to find an atom with an energy level here and here and here? So usually, at most, you will find one of these. So in, in practice, there are three possibilities. One.
is that you are you have a near one photon resonance. Another possibility is that you have a near two photon resonance. So the first case you had an energy level here, second case you have an energy level here. And the third case then is that you have a nearly three photon resonance. Now, we will find out by doing explicit calculations that any one of these three possibilities will lead to a great enhancement in the size of the nonlinear coupling. But this is the best strategy, almost always, for the following reason. If you tune your laser to a one photon resonance, you're going to get lots of absorption here. And turning light into heat is never a good idea if you want to do nonlinear optics. You say, well, I avoid that problem in this case, except that here, the light that you're trying to generate is, is sitting on a one photon resonance. Uh, so, uh, so there, the light you're trying to create gets absorbed. But in this case here, you can have a enhancement of the nonlinear response, but you don't have to worry about uh, linear absorption of either the input field or the output field. So that's just to, just to keep in mind, uh, just uh, uh, some of the overall, f overall features of the nonlinear uh, no, of the quantum mechanical model of optical nonlinearities. Okay, so now we have to just get right into the uh, issue. Okay, so as I said, you can do the calculation using the wave function or using the density matrix. Let's start out using the wave function. For the experts in the room, You can talk about a state vector in Hilbert space, or you can talk about a wave function. The, these are just two different ways of representing the same thing. So the density matrix is conceptually different from the wave function. Uh, I think the wave function is more intuitive, so I'll call it the wave function. Schroden, if it's good enough for Schrodinger, it's good enough for us. It's a really stupid joke, <laughs> and no one knows if it's true or not, but it uh, takes place in a part of the United States where people are not as sophisticated as they are in Rochester, say. This man, uh, this school board meeting, this man walks in and says, I think it's outrageous that you want to spend this much money teaching foreign languages to our children. If English was good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for my children. What's sad is that 
We don't know <laughs> if this is true or not. <laughs> but you could believe it. Okay. Uh, where did that come from? Okay, so state vector. Uh, uh, the state vector resides in Hilbert space. Uh, does anybody care about this distinction? You've heard about state vectors. You have a state vector. You take the projection of the state vector onto the position operator. Now you have a function of position. So this you could call the state vector itself. But once you project the state vector onto the position operator, it becomes a function of position. The state vector resides is, uh, in a multidimensional space known as state space or a Hilbert space. Professors love to teach irrelevant things. Okay, uh, okay. so uh, so we will deal with the wave function, but keeping in mind that that uh, that we could just change the language uh, to that of a state vector. So. Uh, So uh, we, we postulate that the state that, that, that the wave function obeys the uh, Schrodinger equation, I h bar partial psi of r with respect to t is equal to h um, psi of r and t, and this is the Hamiltonian. I put a caret on top to show that it's an operator in Hilbert space or the Hilbert space operator. Uh, if we're working with the wave function, it's just a uh, differential operator. Okay, so the, uh, and we take the Hamiltonian to be H naught plus V of T. And this is the uh, ener uh, energy of the free atom. And V of T is the interaction with the electromagnetic field. Usually, it will be adequate to work in the electric dipole approximation. And in the electric dipole approximation, we take the interaction energy to be minus the dipole moment. Let's not use vectors for now. Uh, minus the dipole moment operator times E of T. And here, the dipole moment operator is the charge of the electron times the position operator of the electron. So it corresponds to your common sense, fundamental undergraduate understanding of a dipole moment. Dipole moment is the charge on the electron times the displacement of the electron from, from the center of some coordinate system. And the energy, using the convention that, that, the, elect, that the charge of the electron is negative. Well, I'm using the convention that E is a positive number, and the minus sign is put there explicitly to, to reflect the fact that the electron has a negative charge. Okay, so, uh, and then we can take E of T to be whatever we want. Uh, uh, You've all heard, you've all had classes in quantum mechanics before. I'm going to go pretty quickly. 
uh, through this park because it's something you know already, but I need to do it because it establishes notation. I mean, you can't start halfway through and say, you remember the solution to Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so uh, there are many, many solutions to Schrodinger's equation. First of all, in the absence of the applied field, I'll abbreviate Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger equation has solutions of the following form. So these are called uh, energy eigenstates, or they're also known as stationary states. They're called energy eigenstates because they correspond to a specific value of the energy. And they are also called stationary states because psi n squared is time independent. The only time dependence is in this exponential phase factor. So for a state of this form, the probability distribution is not time dependent. So, so this name makes sense, this name makes sense. They express two different features of, uh, of the solution. Now, let's take equation two and introduce it into equation one. And we find that equation two satisfies equation one if h naught times u n of r is equal to e n times u n of r. And of course, this is the form, the form of this equation is an eigenvalue equation. An eigenvalue equation means you apply an operator to a function, you get back the same function, but with a number out front. So the number is called the eigenvalue, and then this is called the eigenfunction. And this equation is sometimes called the time independent Schrodinger equation. Solutions are known to form a complete set uh, in the mathematical sense. You, you can form any solution as a superposition of these. And we'll, we'll adopt a normalization condition so that uh, U M star of R U M of R D three R 
is equal to delta m. This is the Kronecker delta. So uh, you, you put, you take any of the energy eigenfunctions, calc take its squared modulus, integrate over all space, you get one. Take two different energy eigenfunctions, put them here, integrate, you get zero. Uh, I'll make a comment that is in some ways very obvious but worth saying. The energy eigenfunctions are, there are many, many solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Even for the free atom, they are not energy eigenfunctions. Any linear superposition of the energy eigenfunctions is also a solution to the Schrodinger equation. Uh, students, I will still call myself a student, sometimes find this baffling. It means that there are states there are allowed quantum mechanical states that don't possess fixed energy. You say, well, but I believe in energy conservation. You say, well, yeah, but, yeah, we believe in energy conservation, but if you form a state that does not have a well-defined energy, that's okay. Uh, nature permits there to be legitimate quantum mechanical states that do not possess a fixed value of the energy. Now we have to solve Schrodinger's equation with the electromagnetic field turned on. By which I mean that now V of T is not equal to zero. So when I say the absence of the applied field, mathematically what I meant is that we set the interaction energy to zero. Now we turn the interaction energy back on. Do I know how to do a frowning face? I guess it's like that, right? Okay. It's a sad face. We have Schrodinger's equation, that's good, but we can't solve it. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that is not a happy uh, circumstance. Uh, but you, so we, you can't solve it exactly, so we have to use some approximation method in order to solve it. I just need to get, to get a drink of water back in two minutes. can't solve it analytically, so we have to develop an approximation method, and this approximation method is known as perturbation theory. Just to remind you, hey, let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this noise. Let's first try going up a little bit. It didn't help, let's try going up more. Let me remind you that there's two types of perturbation theory. There's time-dependent 
and time-independent perturbation theory. What uh, time-independent is when you, for example, uh, put a static magnetic field onto an atom, and you ask how do the energy levels shift, uh, and that's called uh, the uh, Zeeman effect or, or, or the Faraday effect. Uh, we want to do time-dependent perturbation theory, and the reason we want to do time-dependent perturbation theory is that the question is, we have a laser field. We apply a laser field to an atom. The electron cloud starts oscillating back and forth. So the time dependence of the uh, uh, well, the time dependence of the electron motion, or more generally, the atom starts off in the ground state. It ends up in the excited state. We are explicitly trying to determine the time dependence. So we have so for this problem here, we want to use time dependent perturbation theory. This is not to say that time independent perturbation theory is not useful in nonlinear optics. Uh, if you have a very, if you, if you have a slowly varying field, low frequency, uh, it's almost like it's a static field. You can, uh, you can calculate the Stark shift, uh, shift of the ground state energy. And uh, knowing how much the energy of the ground state has changed, you can write that result in terms of chi 1, chi 2, and chi 3. Uh, and I do that in the chapter of the book that I told you not to bother reading. <laughs> uh, the, the chapter of the book on uh, the molecular origin of optical nonlinearities, uh, that is explored in that chapter. Uh, it's it's very important. It, it's the molecular approach. It's how chemists think about things. Chemists have insights that can reinforce some of our insights, but it just is a little bit outside of what most of us tend to be most interested in. Okay, so let's call this the perturbative solution. To the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so, just as a pure formality, let's write the Hamiltonian now as H naught plus lambda times V of T. Lambda is a parameter that is allowed to range from zero to one. We can think of it as a strength parameter. The point being that when lambda is very much less than one, uh, only first order corrections are important. And actually, to get right to the point, these first order corrections, as I'll call them, are the ones that lead to chi 1. Higher order corrections to the wave function lead to chi 2, chi 3. Okay, so just, this is a strength parameter. And in terms of this, We'll seek a solution in the form psi of R and T is equal to psi zero of R and T plus lambda psi one of R and T plus lambda squared psi 2 
of r and t plus dot dot dot. Okay. So 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 we say that we uh, so the the argument is that we cannot solve Schrodinger's equations exactly. We will find, we'll do a Taylor series expansion uh, in, in lambda. So this is the zeroth order solution with the electromagnetic field turned off. This is the lowest order correction. This is the next higher order correction, et cetera. Uh, Let me just write short the equation. Okay, so we now take this expression for the Hamiltonian, use it here. Take this power series expansion for the wave function, use it on both sides. Uh, we now equate equal powers of lambda. Right? If lambda is a continuous variable uh, ranging from zero to one, the only way that we'll have a solution is if all the terms that go like lambda to the first power satisfy it independently, all the ones that go like lambda squared, like lambda cubed, etc. So, First of all, the terms that go like uh, first, all the terms that go like lambda to the zeroth power. In other words, the ones that don't contain lambda at all lead to the equation i h bar partial psi zero with respect to t is equal to h0 times psi 0. So uh, not surprisingly, not surprisingly, the part of this expansion that goes like lambda to the zeroth power is the part that does not depend on lambda and the part does not depend on v of t, so we just regain re re our original equation. Uh, more interesting is the part that goes like lambda to the first power, and this becomes I h bar partial psi 1 with respect to t is equal to h 0 psi 1 plus v psi zero. Okay, so, well first, mathematically, <coughs> I think you see it. This is first order because there's a one here. This is first order because there's a one here. This is first order because v appears once and we put a lambda in front of the V. Uh, lambda, the terms that go like lambda squared is I H bar partial psi two with respect to T is equal to H naught psi two plus V psi one, etc. So uh, I wrote them in this order. Well, first, it's, it's the only rational order in which to write them. But I also wrote them in this order because this gives you a prescription by which you can solve, you can get an approximate solution that is as accurate as you want. Because, well, presumably, we're, the, we already know this. This is the initial state of the system. You know this, now you have a differential equation for, 
a first order differential equation with a known source term. You solve this equation, you know psi 1. Now that you know psi 1, you stick it here, and now you can solve this one for psi 2, and over and over again. OK, so, so this is perturbation theory, which you've seen before. Uh, So uh, now let's uh, let's actually apl let's apply this procedure. Let's see it differently. Uh, You have to start the process somewhere. So what do you choose for psi 0? Well, this is the uh, initial state of the system. Of the atom. Let's assume that the atom is in the ground state. <coughs> it doesn't have to be. Right? I mean, uh, some of you are laser physicists. I mean, you know, you know how to prepare an atom that's not in the ground state. It's called population inversion. Uh, but let, let's let's assume that the atom starts off in, in the ground state. So let's take uh, psi zero of R and T is U and G of R e to the minus I E G T over H bar. So this is the ground state wave function, uh, which in concept you know. In practice, you might not know it unless you're thinking about hydrogen uh, or harmonic oscillator. But in concept, we assume that you know what atom you're talking about. And this is the ground state wave function of that atom. Uh, so that I don't have to write things over and over and over again. Uh, let me write this more generally that the nth order solution is i h bar partial of psi n with respect to t is equal to h naught psi n plus v psi n minus 1. So, so now we can do it for arbitrary n so that we don't have to write this down an infinite number of times. Well, in concept, the dot, dot, dot goes on forever. So let's just do it for, for an arbitrary value of n. This time, let's recall that the energy eigenstates form a complete set. And thus, we can express <coughs> psi n of R and T as follows. <coughs> Psi N of R and T is the sum over all L of A 
L N U L of R e to the minus I omega L T. First of all, E L over H bar is going to show up a lot in the rest of the equations in today's lecture, so that's just called omega L. Uh, but so what is this saying? Okay, the nth order correction to the wave function can be expressed as a linear combination of all of the energy eigenstates of the system with this coefficient. So it, this is just a statement that you can always express this as some linear superposition of the energy eigenstates. This has a name. It's called the probability amplitude. And you know, it's called the probability amplitude because the squared modulus of the probability amplitude gives you the probability that this particular energy eigenstate is contained in this particular contribution uh, to the wave function. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's take this expression for psi n and introduce it into this general form for the nth order correction. And we'll probably go into some more room. So you uh, <coughs> introduce that expansion into the Schrodinger equation, and you find that I h bar sum over L of A L, I'll just use a dot here, and U L of R e to the minus I omega L T is equal to the sum over L A L N minus one V U L of R e to the minus I omega L times time. So, so where are we? We would really, what, do we, what are we trying to do? We're trying to determine this quantity, A sub L, for the nth order solution. We assume that we know this one. Right? So we're going to do them in order. So the, uh, the lower order ones we know already. It's the higher order ones we want to get. The right-hand side we know at least in concept, we know. Left-hand side, we're trying to find each one of these a sub l. But regrettably, there's a sum over all l here. We didn't want to know the sum over all l. We want to know a particular one of these. So we play a trick, and you all know the trick. We play a trick to project out only one term from this summation. And we do this. We left multiply by u m star and integrate over all space. So when we do that uh, using U 
M star U N D three R is equal to delta N M. So this extracts from this summation the val the term in which L is equal to M. So what we end up with is that A M dot N is equal to I H bar to the minus one. Just take this to the other side of the equation. Uh, sum over L of A L to the N minus one V M L E to the I omega N L T. Now, I've, in, I've, I've defined a new quantity here, where V M L is equal to U M star operator V U L D three R. And sometimes It's convenient to write this using Dirac notation. So uh, yeah. V operates on this ket vector. Then you take the inner product of this ket vector with this bra vector to get this quantity. This is just a shorthand for this. And We can call this the matrix element of V. More generally, <coughs> V could be considered to be an operator in an abstract Hilbert space. We choose to represent the operator as a matrix, and then these are the elements of the matrix that represents this abstract operator. But in any case, uh, we have now an equation for the time derivative of AM in terms of something on the right-hand side, which is in concept knowable. So we can just integrate this, and we find that A M N of t is I h bar to the minus 1, sum over L, integral from minus infinity to t, dt prime, V M L of T prime A L N minus one of T prime E to the I Omega M L T prime. There's always this sense of confusion, because I say, we're done. <laughs> and you say, what? We're done? I say, well, yeah, we're done. That's the formal solution. Okay. We're done, at least in theory, we're done. Because if we know every single one of these expansion coefficients, yeah. if we know every one of these, we can calculate the wave function and we can uh, we can calculate every uh, every order of perturbation to the wave function. So everything so everything is here, except for the details. This is a very formal solution to the problem. So let's let's now make it more physical. Let's say, can we do something useful with this, like maybe calculate the refractive index? Uh, getting, I mean, this is an optics course, supposedly. So let's now take this formalism and calculate, well, actually, the linear susceptibility, chi 1. And after, you, uh, after you've done that, you get on a roll. You say, gee, if I can, for major expansion, if I can do chi 1, I can do chi 2. If I can do chi 2, I can do chi 3, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <coughs> so...
Let's apply this to uh, nonlinear optics. Let's say chi 1, chi 2, chi 3. <coughs> Once you've done chi 3, if you want to go to higher order, you just keep turning the crank and go to higher order. Now, if we want to know chi 1, chi 2, and chi 3, what we actually need is a m zero, a m one, a m two, and a m three, which sort of makes sense. It's actually a bit trickier than it might appear, but in order to get chi three, you need all the corrections up to third order. I think that, that sort of makes sense. Uh, well, we have to perform an integration over the uh, uh, matrix elements <coughs> uh, of the uh, of the interaction uh, potential. So let's write this as minus the sum over p. P is just a uh, an index now of mu. Uh, I'll put in the uh, vector nature now. Mu m l dot e of omega p e to the minus i omega p t prime. Okay. The matrix was mu dot E, and now we just represent the electric field as a summation over all of its frequency components in this uh, standard form here. Uh, I guess now we have to define mu. So mu m l is equal to the integral of u m star mu u n d to the r. So this is the dipole moment operator, <coughs> or the electric dipole moment operator. These are the matrix elements of the electric dipole moment operator. Uh, so these are tabulated. There are books. There are people who do this for a living, or, they, or for a hobby, I should say. They uh, they calculate the matrix elements of the dipole moment operator. Now, we're still at a pretty formal level here. So, what is a L0 of t? Remember now, this is our initial condition. This is something that we assume. So, this is delta L G. For the initial state of the system, we know that the system is in the ground state. All of these coefficients vanish except the one where L is equal to G. Now, what about a M1. I'm just going to use a different dummy index here for reasons that will be obvious. <laughs> You'll see. Uh, they're dummy indices, but if we choose them to be different letters of the alphabet, we then don't have to relabel them quite as often as we might otherwise. So AM1 of T. So we take this, we put it in here. Uh, we're summing over L, but L is only equal to G, so that summation reduces to a single term. And we get 1 over H bar sum over P. 
mg dot e of omega p omega mg minus omega p e to the i omega mg minus omega p times t. Well, maybe we get that. <laughs> we integrate from minus infinity to t. We made that assumption. I didn't say we justified the assumption. We ignored something because we didn't want it to be there. And there's the equation. Uh, there's no mathematical justification for dropping this. So why do we drop it? One, we need to drop it. Two, we know that our laser has not been on uh, since t equals minus infinity. 6,000 years, if you believe some people. Uh, we know that the laser has not been on that long. The laser is turned on at some time in the distant past. That is something that is not something we want to deal with right now. Uh, to deal with it would be very nasty. I mean, you can say, I will adiabatically turn on my laser and because of that, the initial condition will be much less important than anything here. In reality, the reason why we can ignore the contribution from minus infinity is that there's damping in any physical system. But there's no damping in our model. And there can't be damping in our model because we're using Schrodinger's equation. And Schrodinger's equation uh, does not and cannot include damping. Uh, it's a Hamiltonian evolution. So, so, in some ways, this is why we have to do density matrix theory next week. Uh, density matrix theory, you have to work out really hard for very little. To justify the fact that the contribution from t equals minus infinity does not appear in the final solution, you have to use a different conceptual formulation of quantum mechanics. Because quantum mechanics cannot deal with damping. Or, no, the, wave, the wave function picture cannot deal with damping. Okay, so for right now, we just dropped it. Uh, but this is truth in advertising. When I play a trick in class, I tell people about it. Okay, and similarly, now, now you take this and you plug it in here and you integrate again and you get AM2 T is equal to 1 over h bar squared sum over p and q sum over m. I'm going to write this out on several lines. Mu m mu and m dot e of omega q mu m g dot e of omega p omega and g minus omega p minus omega q omega m g minus omega p all times e to the i omega m g minus omega p minus omega q times t and the third order contribution you can look up in the book. 
because you don't want to see it. But now let's, let, let's look at the form that we are seeing. And to our great joy, this makes sense. This is supposed to be the first order correction to the wave function. It's proportional to E, the electric field strength. This is supposed to be the second order correction to the wave function. And it goes like E times E. So as advertised, this is the second order correction. That is the first order correction. Thinking of the physics, you have, this is called a one photon resonance. If the energy of one photon is equal to this energy spacing, you will get a huge enhancement in this probability amplitude. For the case of two, the second order, uh, you have a one photon resonance and what we call a two photon resonance. Because if the sum of the omega p photon and the omega q photon adds up to this energy, you also get a large enhancement in the nonlinear response. Is it cold in here? <laughs> of course, I'm working. <laughs> we can close. Oh, we see the problem. This is open, this is closed. I want the cold air blowing on me. Right now, I'm sweltering up here, it's so hot. So we need to, oh. ah, yes. oh, very, very strange. So see if that's, see if that's better. Okay, so this is still pretty formal, right? But almost, you can see a little bit of physics. You can almost see a little bit of physics uh, uh, coming out of this. Okay, so now, now we, we have all of the preliminary results. Now, now we actually can calculate the linear susceptibility. Okay, I'm going to leave this here for now. That, that's the only result we need for the next few minutes. So what I want to do is calculate the linear susceptibility. But as a first step, I want to calculate the induced dipole moment. And I will call it P with a tilde because it's actually in the time domain. And now according to quantum mechanics, how do you calculate an expectation value of an observable quantity? Well, this is the rule that we all know and love. You, uh, you put the operator here, and you put the wave function here, and the wave function here. But now, including first order corrections, we will take the wave function to be the unperturbed wave function plus the first order correction to the wave function the one that has these probability amplitudes. Uh, 
So then P is given by psi 0 mu psi 1 plus psi 1 mu psi 0 plus psi 1 mu psi 1. But of course, this is a second order contribution, not a first. So we drop this one. Because we only wanted we only want the, the we only want the lowest order correction to the induced dipole moment per atom. And that's the sum of these two terms. Now let, let's let me just uh, accumulate all the things that we need. These are in your notes, but let's so in order to evaluate this, we need psi zero, which we've agreed was u g of r e to the minus i e g t over h bar or e to the minus i omega g times t as the shorthand that we introduced. What do we take for psi 1 of r and t? We take the sum over L of a L 1 of t times u L of r e to the minus i omega L of t and a L, sorry, let's just formally change this. Okay, so these are the equations that we need to stuff into this formula here. And if you do that, you find that <coughs> P time domain linear part is 1 over h bar sum over P sum over M There's two terms now. First one is mu g m, mu m g dot e of omega p over omega m g minus omega p times e to the minus i omega p t. So we do like this. And we get a second contribution, which is mu m g dot e of omega p. star mu m g e to the i omega p t. I ran out of space there. And in the denominator, omega m g minus omega p. Okay. So that's just you just do it. Just bookkeeping. These are all the terms we have. You introduce the terms into here. And let's see. So in the same order, <coughs> in the same order is written here. This is the first term in that expression. This is the second term in that expression. We're now going to introduce a trick.
we will formally replace omega mg by omega mg zero minus i gamma m over two. Uh, we have the energy eigenvalue. I'm going to pretend that there is an imaginary contribution to this. We know it's there. Even from, your, even from the harmonic oscillator, you know that there's damping. Uh, as I said 10 minutes ago, we cannot justify it at this moment. We have to use density matrix theory to do it. But we know that there's going to be an imaginary part. So let's just put it here for now. And the justification will come very much later. Now, uh, adopting that convention that omega can be complex, then yes, you need a star here. If, maybe if, you, if you trace this through. Ah. Because it comes from the bra, not the cut. So, 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 uh, so, so then when you, when you write it out, you need a complex conjugation. Okay. Uh, I think I will erase this now. Now we will play another trick. I will replace omega p by minus omega t in the second term. Why is that permitted? Well, again, p is a uh, p is a, just an index. P is <laughs> p is p is just an index. We're summing over all p, and by our convention, the summation over p goes over all the positive and all the negative frequencies. So when I change omega p to minus omega p, I will still be summing over all omega p's. So so no, I've not changed anything in the answer. But this now allows us to write this as P1, little p. By the way, I try very hard. This is my big P. This is my little p. This was the polarization. This is the dipole moment per atom just so that we, 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 we keep straight. This is, not, this is not the P that appears in Maxwell's equations. This is the dipole moment per atom. So we now find that this is equal to 1 over h bar sum over P sum over M mu g M mu M g dot e of omega p omega m g minus omega p plus u g m dot e of omega p mu M G Omega M G star plus Omega P all now times e to the minus I Omega P times T. Why did we want to do this? This is a very difficult equation to try to understand. Uh, because the time dependence of the first term is different from the time dependence of the second term. So you say, well, which term is larger? Well, uh, which term is larger? Well, are we talking about the positive frequency parts or the negative frequency parts? Here, both of these terms now have the same time dependence associated with them. 
And at this point, I think we can clearly say that this is the resonant contribution and this is the non-resonant contribution. Uh, because if this is the ground state and if you have a state M up here, then omega P could resonantly excite this level. But for this second term here, uh, there's a plus sign. So I'll draw it as a dashed line. This term could become resonant only if there was a state here. But there is no state there because we've assumed that the atom started in the ground state. So this is the anti-resonant term, whereas this we can call the resonant term. So now we just need to do a little bit of bookkeeping because this is the induced dipole moment per atom and we'd really like to turn this into a susceptibility, which we could then turn into a refractive index and go home, claiming you've accomplished something today. So now, just the, the bookkeeping issues. So now let's introduce the polarization vector in the time domain, which is the number density of atoms times the uh, dipole moment per atom first order contribution. And as before, n is the number of atoms per unit volume. Then we can take P1 and represent it as the sum, oh, terrible notation, sum over little p of P1 e to the minus i omega pt. And now this is the amplitude of the polarization vector. We can now write one Cartesian component of this amplitude at frequency omega p to be the sum over j of epsilon zero chi i j of omega p e j of omega p. And then this defines, so we define the susceptibility, which we did earlier in the class, in the course. We define the susceptibility as the constant proportionality that sits here, and we find that chi 1 ij is equal to n over epsilon 0 h bar sum over m mu i g m mu j m g over omega m g minus omega p and our second term becomes mu j g m mu i m g omega m g star plus omega p. 
So this is our final result. Uh, it's nice, isn't it? Although you knew the answer already. Right? It's exactly what you got from the harmonic oscillator for the homework problem. So let's just see what you would get here. So if you plot the imaginary part of chi 1, I'll just do the, uh, the scalar version now. If you plot this as a function of omega, well, we called it omega p, we can just call it omega for now. So the imaginary part corresponds to a Lorentzian at, at omega mg. I, a, a crucial point. Let's plot this. We'll assume that there is one dominant resonance. This is actually a, a fairly crucial point. When you did the classical calculation, there is a resonance frequency. Omega zero is the square root of k over m, k being the Hooke's law constant. Quantum mechanics leads to a very, very different result. Quantum mechanics says that there can be many resonance frequencies. A spring, a mass on a spring has one resonance frequency. Quantum mechanics says that there can be many resonance frequencies. So, I mean, easy to overlook because it looks so much like the classical result, except for the summation over M. Uh, nonetheless, let's assume that one of these is the dominant resonance. Then, if you plot the imaginary part of chi, you'll get a Lorentzian. Uh, at, at this location here, and it's full, it's width. Uh, we'd have to think through exactly what the width is. I think full width at half maximum is gamma m. And if we plot the real part of chi 1 as a function of frequency, we get we get a curve that looks like this crosses zero at omega mg and for most optical materials this is somewhere in the ultraviolet This is in the visible part of the spectrum. So this conforms with our understanding uh, and knowledge that in the visible part of the spectrum, the refractive index is a increasing function of frequency. Or that this is normal dispersion. Okay, this might be a good point to take a short break. We're at a good stopping point. So, uh, I get to sit down and you get to stand up. Now, is it warm enough now? Still cold? I'm still a little cold. Okay, but okay, it was a step in the right direction. Okay, I'll, I'll close it more. The heat is on. So, I mean, nobody who believes in a green planet would, would approve of this. They turn on the heat, and the only way you can control the temperature is, is to modulate how far open the window is.
Well, this one is warm. They're, they're, But anyway, this heater, there, there, there's, there's heat coming out of this one. So what do we want to talk about? I told you, I, I think I said, told the class that Ferenc Krauss is coming to Ottawa next week. So, do you know of him? No, I've never heard of him. Okay, no. I mean, he's, he's not one of the big names. I mean, you've you worked with uh, Margaret and Henry, but Ferenc is another one of the big names in that area. Uh, and he's from Munich in Germany. Oh. Poor guy. I mean, he has to come over. I mean, he's missing Oktoberfest. <laughs> he, he's missing Oktoberfest. Although my German friends tell me that Oktoberfest is usually in September, when the weather is still good. So, so, so uh, okay. So, Ferenc Krauss is coming uh, to speak at our, at our symposium next week. Atel science, atel second science. So, Paul Corkum and Ferenc Krauss about 20 years ago, came up with an idea of how to build lasers that could produce attosecond pulses. Uh, and they did it. So they came up with the idea, and then they worked very hard, and they uh, uh, demonstrated this over, I mean, I think the demonstration was over 10 years ago uh, now. Uh, so that their, their first, uh, their first success was to produce a pulse that was about 600 attoseconds long. Reason why that's important. Have I said this in class already? I forget. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm telling you anyway. No, we're talking to the camera, of course. Uh, the reason why this is important is that this is the time scale of which chemical reactions take place. So uh, both Paul Corkum and Ferenc Krauss have done experiments in which they see the electron cloud rearrange itself in real time as molecules come together. Uh, so it, uh, it raises the question, what next? What next in the sense, what is, okay, I mean, you can imagine a shorter laser pulse, but then you ask, but what physical phenomena are uh, fast enough that you need that type of resolution? And I assume there's a good answer. I just don't know what the answer is. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, uh, uh, probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, al almost certainly. I mean, uh, time scales tend to be the inverse of the energy involved. So highly energetic interactions you'd expect to be, uh, they could occur on, on short time scales. In fact, atom second science is necessarily related to high harmonic generation, which you're talking about, because of the Fourier relation. I mean, you, you, uh, I mean, you cannot build an attosecond pulse with visible light. Uh, so, I mean, uh, that was the trick. And I have to admit, I do not understand all the technical details. But in the high harmonic generation process, uh, well, in the high harmonic generation process, which you're talking about, it automatically tends to form short pulses. Uh, the trick then is for them to isolate a single one of those pulses. I mean, yeah, uh, I mean not that it's not a good achievement to have a train of pulses, each of which is at a second duration. But I understand that they have found ways to isolate a single one of these pulses. So that is what uh, so I don't know exactly what Ferenc will talk about uh, next week, but that is what he is famous for. I'd really like to go there mm -hmm. to see that yeah. presentation. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah. So the the, uh, the registration is still open. It's free. Uh, you got to get yourself there. 
Four and a half by car, and six by airplanes. <laughs> now, because there's no direct flight, there's no direct flight. Uh, you have to go through customs. Uh, so I usually drive. Uh, like yesterday. So I came in, I drove in yesterday so I could teach today. And then I advised my graduate students on Saturday. So, so I know that students are committed if they want to join my group because I have to have group meetings on Saturday. <laughs> on the other hand, I leave them alone Monday through Thursday. So. <laughs> So that there's a trade-off either way. Yeah, homes both in Ottawa and here in Manchester. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, this was. I mean, I, I've only been uh, on the faculty of Ottawa for five years, and I was here for thirty years. Uh, so yeah, we have we have our. our I, I don't want to say things that would be insulting to the, uh, the Canadians. Like my real home is here. I don't call it my real home. I call it my traditional home. is, is in Webster, New York, and in Ottawa we have a uh, we have an apartment uh, because you wouldn't the, the last thing in the world you'd want you would want would be to have two lawns you have to mow every week. Uh, so in in Ottawa uh, we live in an apartment uh, downtown. Uh, so we can walk. I could walk. I can walk to the houses of Parliament. Uh, for, for my home. Uh, so it's nice to live in a city. In a, in a certain sense, Rochester is not a city, if you know what I mean. Yeah. There's no doubt. I mean, yeah. it's not a city. Uh, I mean, it, it's like a donut, right? <laughs> uh, and there's a hole in the middle of the donut, and the hole in the donut is downtown. Uh, but it's not a typical. It is not atypical of an American city. I mean, most American cities have evolved in that way for reasons we know very well. So, uh, first class, I said that this course could be challenging on an undergraduate. Could you tell me your perspectives now that you're several weeks into this? Similar right. The professor from his office's classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're looking at Robbie oscillations. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, agreed. I mean, this class is not inconsistent with an undergraduate doing well in it, but the material comes quickly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. So homework is due today, is that right? Is that what I said? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I've been uh, negligent. Ah, homework. So uh, the first two of them I gave you two weeks each. In the future, I will give you two weeks, but they'll be due one a week. <laughs> Overlap, I mean, I will assign one what I should have done, what I meant to do is a week is one week ago, give you an assignment that was due in two weeks. Then today, give you an assignment that is due in two weeks. So the first two assignments, I gave you two weeks to do them. Now I will start giving assignments that are due in one week. Uh, but I'll try to give them to you ahead of time so that you can balance your workload a little bit better so that you can pretend to balance your workload a little bit better. I was once a student. You do your homework the night before it's due. Right? So whether I assign it two weeks ahead of time or one week ahead of time, it, it doesn't have a lot of practical difference. No, it's like me. I write my lecture the night before I give it. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, any, any discussion? Any questions about the course material? Or the last lecture, or the homework, or anything else? I was really confused about the discussion on OPR in the book. Okay. Where you talked about the alignment, because oh. a lot of delta and beta and this stuff. Oh, that's awful, yeah. I don't, you, you've noticed I don't teach it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, I believe everything is correct. No, but the theory of the OPO is very complicated, very complicated. Uh, because you have, because the, the, uh, you have several physical effects that can fight one another. Phase matching tells you what uh, uh, what signal idler frequencies you have, but there's also a cavity resonance condition. Uh, so if the signal frequency is a cavity resonance, that will build up to a much higher intensity. Uh, what if the signal and the idler are both near cavity resonance. Well, that's good. But what if the resonance frequency of the cavity is just a little bit away from the phase matched frequency? So the, potent one, uh, the physical system will sort of hedge its bets. It, it, it will pull it slightly away from the cavity resonance. So, so that, those were the issues going on there, which I fought my way through once. And the feeling is that probably most people who are taking this course do not want to go that deeply into the subtleties of uh, singly resonant versus doubly resonant. This raises a point. Uh, How much, I mean, how much of the book do you want to read? Or how much of the book do I want you to read? Uh, or how much of the book do you have to read I mean, uh, to do well in the course? I mean, those, those, are not all, those are not necessarily the same, don't have the same answer. Uh, so, I mean, I think it would be unrealistic to tell you that you're supposed to know inside and out everything in the book. I, mean, I can't keep everything straight at, at, at a given time. Uh, there's just too much there. Uh, so my advice is read everything as if it was a, a novel. <laughs> read it for fun. <laughs> uh, read it. Uh, it's good to know what's in there because uh, at some time in your life, you're probably going to, there's probably very little in there that is not relevant to somebody who does optical physics. But that's not to say you need to understand everything at this moment. So read it, read through everything to know what's there, and then only study the parts that are relevant to the uh, to the homework uh, or to material that we covered in class. Uh, you should remind me at the end of the semester that I said this, but I don't think I'm going to have any questions on the exams on material that was not presented in lecture. I mean, it might be a difficult question, and maybe the answer did not come out of what I said in lecture, but, but uh, you'd have to under, oh. And I try to ask questions that are based on uh, conceptual understanding. Did we talk about midterm exam? No. I, I didn't tell you it's on October 30th? That's all you told us. Oh, okay. I told you it's October 30th. Okay. So, so the exam will be on October 30th. Uh, at some time before the exam, and again, uh, reminders are always useful, uh, I will send you the exams for the past several years so you get a feeling for what sorts of questions I, I tend to ask. Uh, it will be closed book. One sheet of handwritten notes is, or is permitted. Uh, there's always the question that students say, 
do you expect me to memorize all of this? And the answer is, if you, I think I gave an example in class last week. If you understand, you can just write down the equation for memory. No, if you understand, you, you can write down the equation based on your understanding. And I think the example I gave last week was on type one and type two phase matching. That uh, if you understand, uh, you would have no problem reproducing which it should be the ordinary polarization and which should be the extraordinary polarization for either positive or negative uh, birefringence. So, th th so those tend to be good questions. Well, that would be good for a closed book exam, no, no notes, uh, because nobody could have memorized that. <laughs> Uh, but if you understand it, you just, you just write it down. So those are the questions I'd like to ask, uh, questions of that sort. Uh, okay, so as the time gets closer, I will send more information. No more questions. No discussion. Okay, so we, we got to this point here. Let me just make a few simple comments before we continue. I mean, before we move on to something else. Uh, it's really a lot of fun to take this a formula and evaluate it. I think there are two homework problems at the end of that chapter that suggest that you do this. Um, one of them is for glass. And without cheating, the very first time in my life that I evaluated this formula for glass, I came up with the prediction that n which is the square root of 1 plus chi 1 was equal to 1.4. You see, there is a God. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so how do you evaluate things like this? I mean, in concept, you're supposed to sum over all the excited states of the material. Uh, but there often there really is just one dominant resonance. Uh, so what would you take for mu? It's roughly the charge of the electron times the Bohr radius. So in doing order of magnitude calculations, and in uh, chemists especially, the, the unit in which they measure uh, dipole moments is called the Debye unit. And the Debye unit is approximately E times A naught. I forget, there's a numerical factor, if I recall correctly. Uh, Okay, so I mean, that's the intuition. I mean, that's why you should be able to do these calculations, uh, why, why you can make a decent estimate of this. Uh, you know that glass starts absorbing in the UV, so you might assume that this resonance is uh, 300 nanometers or something. So you just take a guess. Uh, as to what omega, as to what the res transition frequency is. And on the basis of that transition frequency, uh, you use that for this quantity here. You use Ea naught for this and for this. 
and this, uh, the number per of atoms or molecular units per unit volume, you know based on Avogadro's number. Uh, you know, formally you look up the, uh, the molecular weight of one molecular unit, you look up the, the density of glass, you divide one by the other, and that tells you what the number density is of molecular, molecular units. And it tends to be something like 10 to the 23rd per cubic centimeter. Or something like 10 to the 29th per cubic meter. So, so uh, you can impress yourself by how good this uh, very simple estimates are. You can estimate the refractive index of glass, and you will get a very realistic prediction. The other example is a rubidium vapor. And that's another question. Uh, how highly absorbing is a dense atomic vapor? So you can put numbers in and uh, determine that as well. I said, let's assume that there is one dominant resonance. The truth is that this is often a very good approximation. Uh, so what you typically might have, let's plot this as the imaginary part of chi 1. You have a strong resonance here. It might be something like this. You have a strong resonance, yeah. atomic energy levels. There's the ionization limit. This is the first excited state. There's an infinite number of states in here, and they get successively closer together as you approach this. Okay. So there's an infinite number of them, but the first one is invariably the strongest, oh, at least for, for simple atoms. Uh, so the absorption coefficient as a function of frequency might look like this. There's the concept of the oscillator strength which is called F. Oh, let's be more careful. F M G. The formula is in the book. But F M G is proportional to mu M G squared. So for any one of these absorption lines, you can assign a dimensionless unit that is known as the oscillator strength. And it, it's, there's a very, very nice uh, mathem, uh, mathematical physics proof that the, that the oscillator strengths always have to add up to 1. And it's also true that F, M, G, well, it's real, and it's a positive number. Okay. So the oscillator strengths are positive. They all have to add up to 1. And this might have an oscillator strength of 0 0.8. 
typical, I guess. That means that 80% of the absorption is given in this one transition. All the rest of the absorption is distributed among the infinity of transitions that are shown here. Okay. So what is the conclusion? Conceptually, quantum mechanics is very different because you have, there's an infinite number of resonances. On the other hand, it's usually only one of these resonances that is very important. This goes back to Fraunhofer, the Fraunhofer lines uh, in the Earth's atmosphere or the, sun, or the sun's emission. This one's called the resonance line by traditional spectroscopists. That th this, this transition here is so strong that they call it the resonance line. Why are sodium lamps orange? <laughs> it's the resonance line. So for the case of sodium, this would be 3s, this would be 3p, and this is about 580 nanometers. So uh, in a sodium <laughs> lamp, there's an electrical discharge the electrical discharge tends to excite the excited states. They trickle down to this level here, and then this level, the transition to the ground state, is called the sodium resonance line. 580 nanometers. And the spontaneous emission lifetime of this is 16 nanoseconds. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, it's sort of nice to have your feet set conceptually. So uh, memori memorizing a few of these numbers can be very useful. So allowed tra optical transitions, allowed optical transitions typically have a lifetime from 5 to 20 nanoseconds. That, that's just something you, 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 you keep in mind. Uh, neodymium, what is its lifetime? You've taken the lasers course more recently than I have. How embarrassing. None of us remember. Or for Ruby. I forget too. For Ruby, first laser, of course, was Ruby. Uh, life, spontaneous emission lifetime is maybe 10 milliseconds. For neodymium, what the laser lab is built out of, it's uh, maybe a microsecond. What does that tell you? These are not allowed transitions. We have the concept of an allowed transition. The transitions that make most lasers work are ones that naively cannot occur at all. They're called forbidden transitions. Uh, when people say it's a forbidden transition, they mean that it is forbidden in the electric dipole approximation. Uh, th th they mean that this quantity, this quantity, when calculated naively, vanishes. Uh, it's, it's due to some high order terms that allow this to happen. There's a whole section in the book on, uh, on uh, linear response, uh, I what I called it, linear, uh, the linear susceptibility. I mean, going through all these things, how, how, to, how to calculate the oscillator strength, the fact that the oscillator strengths add up to one. Uh, so that's good stuff. Uh, so I'm telling you which parts to read, that, uh, uh, which is how we got onto this. Okay, now, uh, okay. That is chi one.
what about chi 2? Here, I'm going to skip a lot of steps. They're all in the book if you want them. So, uh, we start off asking the question, what is the second order contribution to the dipole moment per atom? And we find that there are three contributions. Let me write it first, and then we can talk. So there are three ways in which you can have a second order contribution to the induced dipole moment. The perturbation can act twice on the ket vector can act once on the bra, once on the cat, can act twice on the bra, and uh, not at all on the cat. Okay, so in all these cases, 0 plus 2 is 2, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 0 is 2. Okay, these are the three ways it can happen. Yes, good thing. One question. Um, is a new operator a Hermitian? Yes. I think it is. Sure. So the first time I saw him, I just the comments can be. I'll think more about that. Good question. Well, I know. I mean, I know what you get when you just, when you just turn the crank. You, uh, they, they look different. They look different, but it's that trick we played before, that uh, to rearrange terms. So, thank you. That's, uh, that will keep me awake at night. But you know that eventually I'm going to answer it then, because I like my sleep. Okay, so... Uh, So I'm going to skip a couple of steps. Uh, you, you can tell how terrible this is going to be. We have explicit formulas for all everything here. We stick them in, we rearrange terms, and we are then going to argue that P2 is N times little p Two, and then we're going to argue that this is the sum of P, I'll just call it omega R, e to the minus R omega T, and then we will argue that P I two omega p plus omega q, going back to the definition of chi 2 that we've been using all semester, is the sum over j and k, sum over p and q, chi 2 i j k, omega p plus omega q, omega p, Omega Q E J Omega P E K Omega Q. Okay, so pages and pages of notebook get filled up with formulas, and at the end you express the results in terms of chi two, and what you find is that chi 2 ijk omega p plus omega q omega p omega q let me just write it 
on across the board. There's a permutation operator that we'll come back to. Sum over m and n. Now, mu g n, mu n m, mu m g i j k, omega n g minus omega p minus omega q omega m g minus omega p that's the first term second mu g n mu n m mu m g j i k omega n g star plus omega q times omega m g minus omega p and the third term mu g n mu n m mu m g i k j omega n g star plus omega q omega m g star plus omega p plus omega q. What can I say? Let me draw pictures. Each one of these can be understood in terms of a very simple diagram. Omega p omega q this is level m this is level m and this is g so you just look at this you go you start at the ground state you go up to level m by absorbing an omega p photon you then go up to level n by absorbing, in addition, an omega Q photon. And then you go from level N back to the ground state by emitting this photon here in omega P plus omega Q. And you know, quantum mechanics usually reads right to left, like traditional Chinese, <laughs> as we commented earlier. <laughs> Okay, so, so here's the story. You start here, you start in the ground state, you make a transition to M, you go from transition M to state N, you make a transition from N back to the ground state. I, J, and K tell you the polarizations of the photons that are involved in this process. Now let's look at the second term. Second term has a different interpretation. Omega P and Omega Q G M N and let me draw the final one as well. Here you start in level G, you emit the sum frequency photon, then you realize I was not permitted to do that. I don't have enough energy to do it. So you quickly absorb an omega p photon 
and an omega Q photon to conserve energy. So then this is M and this is N. Now, of course, M and N are dummy variables. So I have arbitrarily chosen that in all cases, we go from G to M to N back to G. But uh, we could have used different letters there. Uh, the key issue, I think, is the nature of the uh, resonances. This one could be totally resonant if there was a level here and a level here. This one could be resonant with level M, but certainly cannot be resonant with level M because we've assumed that G is the ground state. This contribution here is totally anti-resonant. Totally anti-resonant anti because this by assumption is the ground state. And so by assumption, we don't have a level here or a level here. Now, you look at this as written and you say this expression violates one of our rules of nonlinear optics. And the rule was that the expression has to have intrinsic permutation symmetry. So this, this means take the average of this and a, an additional expression in which omega p and omega q are interchanged. So it would be silly to write this out a second time with omega p and omega q interchanged. So this just says average this with one with omega p and omega q opposite to one another. You know about dipole moment selection rules? So let me point out a small potential problem here. What we mean is that M let's just do it in one dimension. M Z G has to be non zero. Well, let's just work out an example. Let's, let, let, let's, we, all, we think we understand the, so, the uh, hydrogen atom. So let's say that this is the ground state. Let me just redraw this diagram. And let's assume that this is the hydrogen atom. I don't know how we would ever do the experiment because hydrogen forms molecules. But let's say we have a collection of hydrogen atoms. This is the 1s ground state. Uh, in order for the dipole moment to be non-vanishing, this has to be a p state. The selection rule is that the, uh, uh, the orbital angular momentum quantum number has to change by plus or minus one. So an S state can connect only to a P state. And then a P state can, can connect only to an S state or a D state. Again, delta L has to be plus or minus one. So this has to be an S state or a D state. And that means that uh, that mu
that this dipole moment would have to vanish. So we have a small problem. But then we recall that chi 2 is non vanishing only if the medium lacks inversion symmetry. And if the medium lacks inversion symmetry, it means that angular momentum is not a good quantum number. So, spectroscopists who work on the spectroscopy of uh, atoms or, or ions uh, in a crystalline environment know that they cannot talk about uh, uh, what do we call it? LNM in, in the hydrogen atom. You have the angular momentum and then you have the Z component of the angular momentum. In a crystal you just can't do that. Uh, you have to introduce different quantities. So, so what is the point? Earlier we said that to have chi two non-zero, you cannot have a you have to have a material that does not have inversion symmetry. Now, when you look at it from a microscopic point of view, you see that all three of these dipole moments dipole transition moments, in order for all three to be non-zero, you once again have to have a material that lacks inversion symmetry. Because if the material had inversion symmetry, then you could talk about S, P, D, and F, and this would necessarily vanish. Okay. Uh, now... The next logical step would be chi 3. Uh, next logical step would be chi 3. And you can look up the expression in the book. Let me only draw the pictures. Okay, what about chi 3? Well, again, you start off by saying that the third order contribution to the induced dipole moment will be psi 0 and you. Psi three. Plus psi one u psi two plus psi two u psi one plus psi three u psi zero. Okay. So there are four terms, there, there are four ways 
in which uh, you can get a third order contribution. Jiaoping, I still will think about this. Uh, now that we've done this, I mean, the fact that we've, that we've broken the wave function in, into different orders of contributions might uh, be what's going, might be why your and my intuition is not working here. But I mean, um, nil is Hermitian because it's proportional to the, the position operator. Yes. So I think the, the average value here is the real, the real, so nil is observable, so it's real, so these, these two terms should be equal. I think so too, but I know they're not, so. Okay, so, so we're both going to go home and think very, very hard about this. Okay, so there, there are three contributions here. There's a formula in the book, but, again, but I think, to me, the best way to understand it is that the first term says that you can do an omega P, an omega Q, an omega R, and then you come back down with omega p plus omega q plus omega r, g, m, n, and nu. Okay. Second term, up, up, down, up. Third term, up, down, up. Up, and the very last term is down, up, 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 where we, in all cases, we go from G to M to N. To new. G to M to N to new. So, under resonant conditions, the first term will be the largest. Under highly non resonant conditions, all four of these will contribute. I think as one of the very early lectures this semester, I commented that if you're working with quantized fields, maybe the up arrows and the down arrows are physically different because one is an A and the other is an A dagger. And Zhao Peng was going to go home and think very hard about that. But, but now the problem has just evaporated, right? So maybe we don't have to do that calculation. Yes, but one could repeat this using quantized fields. And if you repeat this calculation using quantized fields, I think what we're going to find is that uh, the susceptibility is the same. But, but uh, once we ask what are the noise properties of the interaction, we're going to get very different noise properties for this one compared to this one. I don't know. We, 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 I, I'm speculating right now. Okay, now, uh, why did we... At the beginning of the lecture, I said that there are two reasons why we might want to do this sort of thing. One is to get... Uh, 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 actual numbers out of the theory. The other is to uh, determine uh, some of the uh, structures of the nonlinear susceptibility.
I think this is not the th this is not the right moment because I didn't even show the formula. So you take the formula for chi three, you go to the highly non-resonant limit. When you're in the highly non-resonant limit, when you're in the highly non-resonant limit, you can ignore the imaginary part. Uh, you're so far away from resonance that the real part dominates. You ignore the imaginary part of this quantity here. You look at the formula and you see that you can interchange input fields with output fields without changing the value of the susceptibility. And that is done in the, in the book. Is there any discussion? I have one more topic. I have one more topic. Uh, I have one more topic that I think is very important. Uh, this was so abstract. Steve Harris, uh, uh, brilliant man, professor at Stanford, wrote a paper many years ago that puts all of this into perspective. This is Miles and Harris, 1971. They ask the following question. Could I take a sodium vapor and take a laser at frequency omega and generate light at frequency 3 omega? Well, of course you can do that. So, but they ask questions like, how do you optimize the performance So are there some frequencies are there some frequencies that will more efficiently generate the third harmonic than other frequencies? So they wanted to study the resonance structure. of the third harmonic generation process. Now, their notation was much simpler than mine because they only cared about third harmonic generation. So I'm going to just spend one or two minutes introducing their notation. They take the electric field as E1 e to the minus i omega t plus complex conjugate. They take the uh, nonlinear polarization to the epsilon 0 chi 3 of 3 omega E1 cubed. Since we're doing third harmonic generation, you can just use a very simple notation. Let's call this 3 omega. Uh, and then they do a little calculation that says the chi 3 of 3 omega will be equal to n over h bar cubed sum over a, b, and c of mu g, c mu c b, mu b a, mu a g times, and now I'm going to write down the four resonance terms, and uh, because they're doing third harmonic, the expression is much simpler than the ones I've written before.
So that was my first term. Oh, let me have them in slightly different orders, I see. Uh, omega C G plus omega omega B G plus two omega omega A G plus three omega. And yeah, let's put them here. Omega C G plus Omega Omega B G plus two Omega Omega A G minus omega, and one more term, one over omega c g plus omega, omega b g minus two omega, omega a g minus omega. But now they said we're going to do it for sodium. And for sodium, all omega ij are known. Well, to high accuracy, let's see. So this is not a forgiving formula, right? This is very complicated. But actually, you know everything. You know the spectrum. You know where all the resonance lines are. There, there are handbooks where you can look up all the values of mu. All you need is a computer, to, to, not even a, a number crunching computer, just to do the bookkeeping for you, just to put in the numbers to evaluate this expression. So here is what they found. So for the sodium atom, if you have the book with me, you might just follow along there. The ground state of sodium is 3s, maybe there's 4s, 5s, and then they all run together, and this is the ionization limit. And if this is at zero volts, the ionization limit is something like 5.1 eV. So those are all the S states, right? The S states are the ones with L equals zero. Now, next to these, there are the P states. And the lowest lying P state is the 3P. And then you have 4P and a number of states up here. And I guess what is important is that you also have D states. And the 3D is here. 4D, 5D, like so. And now, right next to this, make that smaller. Right next to this, let me draw the diagram of the third harmonic generation process. So, A, B, C, and down to here. So, here is what Miles and Harris did. As you change this frequency omega, these levels, these dotted, these dashed lines move up and down. For some values of omega, 
you're going to get a resonance associated with any one of these excited states. But, uh, but it's more complicated than that because when you, when you, so again, these are L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two. When you sum over A, you need to include only those levels that have a dipole moment connected to the ground state. And those are only the P states. So sum over A has to be a sum over P states. Sum over B, you either go here or here. Finally, when you sum over C, you once again have to sum only over the P states because this dipole moment here has to take you back to the ground state. I guess to summarize this, we have to apply selection rules. Selection rules tell you which of these dipole transition elements can be non-zero. These are often called dipole transition moments because it gives you the strength of a transition between one energy level and another energy level. Okay, so they did that. I mean, it's just, it's a massive bookkeeping problem, but nothing more, because they knew all of these resonance frequencies, they knew all the dipole moments, and well, this is what they found. So, uh, an enormously rich structure uh, this shows uh, chi 3 on this axis plot as a function of wavelength on this axis here. And there are, it's on a log scale. Uh, it's on a log scale and you see that there are, uh, there are enormous uh, resonances. If we say that the uh, background, the, the non-resonant contribution in their units was 10 to the minus 34. Uh, then at the peaks of these resonances, it goes up at least two orders of magnitude. So to me, this is the conceptual understanding that I find very important. They did do the experiment, by the way. and. Uh, they got as much as 10% conversion efficiency, which is really, really not so bad. Okay, so, so I think the summary is that this quantum mechanical theory of the nonlinear susceptibility works. You can, you can get explicit predictions coming out of the uh, calculation and you can also use it to, uh, to determine, for, for instance, the fact that you have uh, full permutation symmetry when you're working in the non-resonant limit. Okay, that's the end of the lecture. Uh, I'm tired, you're more tired. Uh, if there's questions, please ask. Or why don't you just leave? If you want to have questions, just ask me in person. I made a uh, typo in an email message. I, I, I've invited people in Ottawa to, to, to my home uh, after, the, uh, after one of the seminars was over. And instead of putting walking distance, I put waking distance. 
uh, probably assuming that we would put them to sleep uh, by having to listen to a full day's worth of talks. So, so the, the dean, the, uh, the dean of science who was invited and who accepted, uh, pointed out my typo to me. He, he thought it was a Freudian slip. <laughs> Did that look as if it worked? No. Oh, oh, let me let me turn it off. So that if it breaks, I no. I want me. I want me to break. Uh, no, you're right. You're right. What are students for? <laughs> I get to blame you if something goes wrong. So let's see. I think it's still going. Yeah, it's still going. Now, we push this button, and then we carefully don't do anything till that stops blinking. That, that light, if that light is on, it means that it's transferring data to the memory card. That's the only thing we thought of that could possibly have gone wrong last time. Uh, so, if you, if you don't mind, why don't you pack this one up, and I will pack that sure. one up. So and I press the all now? Yeah, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> no, you, you, you help me, please. Yeah. So, so I will, okay, so we turn this off. Let's put everything right here, Let's, so we don't lose anything. Task, uh, yeah, it's, okay, it's, it's, it's okay now. Yeah. Yeah. You see, that, that's the only thing we thought that could have gone wrong last time. That's an, I, I press it first. I think it's. I stop. No. We think that the SD card is bad. Okay. We we really don't think anybody did anything wrong. And I would just leave this on top of it. Right? You can carry it back just as well, like this. Last week, the camera worked. No. Exactly the same lecture there that I had given him. 